Finding a job as a young person isn't easy. But if you have a learning disability or autism, it can be even harder. By their mid-teens, their futures are already written. Few are encouraged to think about their careers. Up to 95% of these people end up unemployed, becoming dependent on welfare support and missing out on the vital benefits of working life. Their physical and mental health suffers and life expectancy drops by up to 17 years. But it doesn't have to be like this. It can be like this. With the right support, these young people can move into full-time employment, giving them financial independence and a better life. Taxpayers save millions and businesses benefit from an untapped and talented workforce. DFN Project Search provides this support, helping over 1,900 young people into jobs in the UK. Let's help them rewrite their futures. DFN Project Search. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Forbes Nixon. Um, and for those of you who are visually impaired, I am a white middle-aged man, uh, age 57, six foot three, blue suit, white shirt, and blue tie with glasses. Um, I am the executive chair of DFN Project Search and the DFN Charitable Foundation. And I'm here to tell you about the exciting work we're doing to help young people like the three panelists I've got with learning disabilities get into real jobs. It's an honor to be with you today at the IOD Summit. And this timely um, summit is the brainchild of my good friend, Lord Shinquin. Just a bit about my background. So I worked in the city for over 30 years as an investment banker and fund manager. For almost 20 years, I was co-founder, CEO, and chairman of the Alcentra Group, a sub-investment grade credit asset manager, which I started from scratch and built to 42 billion AUM. Last year, I stepped down as um, chairman and CEO, and uh, today I work full-time on my two charities. As a businessman, I always recognize the importance of promoting a diverse workforce. We embrace this at our centre. For example, employing very early on an openly gay receptionist. And I also made sure that our graduate rec recruitment program consisted of at least 50% women every year. Historically, workforces in the UK, especially at senior levels, have been male, pale, and stale. This is unacceptable in today's world, considering over 50% of the population is women, and over 14% are growing fastest from ethnic minorities. And there's been progress in both these, um, these, these types of characteristics, um, and far more awareness and attention is paid to the importance of diversity in these areas. However, it disappoints me to say that disability is one area of diversity where progress has been incredibly slow and has stalled. My interest in this area has been inspired by my son, Charlie, on my right, now age 21, who has both physical and learning disabilities. He is my complete hero and has brought tremendous joy, um, happiness and laughter um, in our families, probably than anything else um, that I can think of. And it was, that was the thing that drove me to set up the DFN Charitable Foundation eight years ago and DFN Project Search four years ago. The management thinker Simon Sinek, whose TED talk uh, I'd recommend that went viral, asked leaders to, ask, um, to start with the why. In business or in any walk of life, it doesn't matter so much about what you do as why you do it. Charlie is my why. When he was young, we couldn't find a suitable school for Charlie, and we looked at over 20 special schools. They looked like prisons or hospitals. They were like holding pens, somewhere just to drop the kids off, to pick them up, very low aspirations. So in the end, I ended up setting up my own special school. I purchased Colonel Dahl's house in um, Surrey called Undershore. I set it up to um, be a special school. Charlie went there for nine very happy years, and it currently has 100 students and is thriving. School and education are key 
for giving everyone a chance and a decent start in life. And Jonathan Sachs once said, to defend a country, you need an army, but to defend a civilization, you need schools. In a similar vein, Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. A good education at school gave Charlie and his friends a good base level of knowledge and learning. But school was only half the battle. I soon realized that these youngsters were having difficulty transitioning from school to jobs. They needed support finding jobs and building the skill set to acquire and, th and thrive in these jobs. And the data on this is truly shocking. There's about one and a half million um, people with a learning disability in the UK, of which one million are of working age. Yet only 5% of this cohort are in full-time paid jobs against 80% of their peer group. I mean, that's quite incredible if we call ourselves a civilized society. And that means 95% are living on benefits, offering suffering with low esteem, family breakup issues, mental health issues, and social isolation. Now, businesses and organizations like yours can help address this. And there are three reasons why this is important. Firstly, and most importantly, employing people with learning disabilities makes great business and financial sense. Studies show that people with a learning disability stay in their jobs three and a half times longer than their non-disabled co-workers. They also show a high proportion of employees with a disability have their job performance rated above average. They're more reliable. They get on to work on time. They take less days off sick. And they're great culture carriers for the organizations. They soften organizations and they lift organizations. The second reason why we should support those with learning disabilities relates to social impact. So we heard a bit today about ESG. I'm sure you guys are all familiar with environmental, social, and governance. And there's a lot of talk about E, the E bit, environmental, and the G bit, governance, but not much about the S bit. And for young people with disability challenges, being in employment improves their health and well-being. It gives them a sense of purpose, identity, and status. So employing these youngsters ticks the S box. Thirdly, it's morally the right thing to do. Every life is of equal value. And in a civilized society, there should be the provision of high quality care for all those in need. And indeed, again, we heard about the Gen Z um, youngsters coming through. And indeed, they, they demand that, um, they will, that they want to work for diverse organizations that really employ a cross-section of talent out there. According to one respected think tank, the Centre of Social Justice, a rise of just 5% in the disability employment rate, not only those with learning disabilities, would lead to an increase in GDP of 23 billion by 2030. So we have defined the scale of the problem and the three imperatives to do something about it. So what are we actually doing about it? Well, we're taking action. DFN Project Search runs a supported internship program to help young people with learning disabilities and autism um, to develop their core skill set and get into full-time jobs. We work on our program with partners like Goldman Sachs, Hilton, Marriott Hotels, Next Distribution, DPD, a range of universities, and um, our biggest partners are NHS Trust. They're brilliant as um, host businesses. Th these all act as host businesses for internship programs. And we've got over 120 sites, and we've got over 2,000 kids um, with learning disabilities into jobs over the last few years, and we're serving about 1,000 a year, and we're looking to ramp that up significantly. And our intervention works. We get about 70% into jobs, and we get 60% into full-time paid non-seasonal jobs, so well above the national average of 5%. At the end of September, DFN Project Search launched the Inclusion Revolution campaign during National Inclusion Week to draw attention to this. And we set ourselves an audacious target of getting 10,000 youngsters with learning disabilities into jobs by 2030 and 20,000 by 2035. We're also proud to have been selected recently by the Department for Education alongside the National Development Team for Inclusion and the British Associated, um, Association of Supported Employment to be the consortium called Internship Works, 
commissioned to double the number of supported internships in England from 2,250 to 4,500 by March 2025. This work is important and it is urgent. And I think the young people we are working with can help address today's skill shortage. Indeed, with the opportunity and the right training, one million disabled adults of working age could easily fill the 1.4 million unfilled jobs currently in the hospitality, care and hospital sectors. In his iconic I Have a Dream speech, Dr. Martin Luther King stated the following. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I also have a dream that children and all others with a learning disability and autism will not be shaped by their disabilities, but by their skills and experience and be embraced by business and society. Together with you and other enlightened employers, let's work to make this dream become a reality. Thank you very much indeed. I'll now ask a recent graduate of Deerfield Project Search, Charlie, on the panel, to tell us a bit more about his experience on this program, and then I'll open it up to questions from our three panelists, um, Dylan, Harry, and Charlie. So, Charlie, over to you. you sit down. Yeah. Sit down and do that. Go on. I need you. you can do it up here if you want. Do you want to do it up here? Okay. Uh, Go on. Go on. Uh, Speak. Your mic. Hello. Yeah. Up. Okay. Why should someone do DFAB project search? There are thousands of young people in this country who have learning disabilities and sometimes physical disabilities as well, like me. Most of these young people would like to work, get out of the house, earn their own money, and feel good about themselves. However, there are limited opportunities for them to work because they need extra help and support to gain good life and work skills and to find the right employment for them. There are not many organisations that offer the right support and have a success rate that train youngsters like me to find jobs and stay in jobs. As a consequence, only 5.1% of people with special educational needs and disabilities gain permanent paid employment in the UK, compared to 80% of their peers. I find this a disgraceful statistic and a social injustice. DFM Project Search offers a great solution to this problem of getting youngsters like me into employment. <coughs> In fact, it is the largest transition to work program for people with learning disabilities and autism in the world. An incredible 70% of those on DFM project search programs secure paid work at above a minimum wage and an incredible 60% of graduates are in full-time roles. These statistics make a striking contrast to the general 5.1% mentioned earlier. Project Search is structured as a one-year transition to work program for eight to 12 young adult students linked to a local special needs or SEND college. They do 10 to, tre 10 to 12 internships of a local host business. The local host business might be university, hospital, hotel, airport, local authority, or some other large business. The structured program means that for each of the three internships or rotations, the intern has the support of trained job coaches and tutors, as well as work mentors for the host business to help them acquire marketable skills for employment. The job coaches interact with the job mentors 
So that the intern's needs and issues are met and suitable work targets are met and set for them. Everything is closely monitored so that the intern is making as much progress as possible, learning and applying their job skills to a real job situation. The intern has to record what they've done each day on their rotation in a special book. Every Friday, the full cohort of interns at the host business have a day at the Lynx Special Needs College and share what each of them has done on their internships. They also benefit from receiving relevant teaching from the college tutors to help build up their work skills. In addition, the Fridays together mean that all the interns get to know each other well and share problems and other experiences. During the internships, the interns start to work out with the help of their job coaches what sort of jobs they want to do in the future. When they secure a job, they have a follow-on job coach who ensures that the intern turn graduate integrates successfully into their permanent role and helps the employer offer the best supports and adjustments at hand. This makes an enormous difference to graduates who need extra hand-holding as they enter the big, wide world of work after graduating from Project Search. I speak from experience as I was on a DFN Project Search program last year at Queen Mary University of London with six other interns. Many SEND students have specific challenges and most are very anxious, so at the start of the year, all of us at Queen Mary's were very anxious. So at the start of the year, all of us at Queen Mary's were apprehensive and not sure what to expect. We were told we would be totally supported by a tutor and a job coach, and we were all introduced to our mentors as we each moved into our rotations. Job coaches and tutors went out of their way to support us if we were overwhelmed or were anxious during our rotations. The job coaches would then speak to the host business mentors and they would work to resolve our difficulties. Our confidence grew throughout the year, and I am pleased to announce that all six of my fellow interns have now got jobs. To conclude, I think that every young person flowing difficulties, and perhaps physical, physical difficulties as well, should have an opportunity to be in full-time employment. Most of us dearly want to work because work makes us happier, healthier, more confident and more controlled of our lives. As mentioned earlier, it is absolutely shocking that only 5.1% of young people like me are in paid employment. The main reason for this is that there's hardly any employability programs to help train and support people like me to get into jobs and stay in jobs. Having been on the DFN project search program and having learned how successful it is in getting people like me into jobs, DFN project search seems to be one exception. I would like to help spread the word of DFN project search's mission so that more and more youngsters can benefit from their programs each year. Thanks, Charlie. That's brilliant. Right, um, okay, and all, um, all of these guys, so um, Charlie, Harry, and Dylan, they've, they're all in jobs. They've all been through internship programs. They all had a lived experience, so I think that's super important and super exciting. So these guys are pioneers and really sort of um, holding the torch and, and taking it forward. Let me ask um, Harry a quick question. So Harry, um, how do you feel about the employment figure for people with learning disabilities? So how I feel about the important figure for people with um, learning disabilities going into work, absolutely disgusting. You've all here had the right to go to work. You all here had the opportunity to change jobs. 
to further their particular career skills without, um, without thinking, oh, what about benefits? What about family? What about support? 98% of you probably have got, probably could look for a new job tomorrow. Probably could change the jobs you wanted to in a flash. For somebody with a learning disability like myself sitting up here, that's not possible. That is just not possible. Even getting a job, I thought I would never have the opportunity to work because of the way the employment figure is and the way society is. Support programmes like DFN, close at sets, and really highlight that the talents and skills every individual have, and we have a learning disability and neurodiversity or other barriers into work, really pioneer that a full equal workforce is truly opportunity. And they're taking a section of that of society, which only gets 5.1% into work, statistics so, change it around and go, well, we, we can get 70 in percent, we can get 60 in the full time. We can change what it means to have a disability and what it means to go to work. You can have these opportunities and we can make it possible. That's how I feel and that's what, and I'm so delighted to be working for them. Thanks, Harry. That's, uh, that's, that, that's a really good answer. Uh, let me pose a question to Dylan. Um, Dylan, what positives can disabled people bring to a business? The, what the positives that a disabled person can bring to a business would be that they give the commitment and productivity to a business and bring problem solving skills that some that don't wouldn't have and they can give the insight that's needed to give the business low turn, staff turnover rate. That's, that's, a, that's a very good point, very good answer. Um, let me open it up. We've only got, I think, five more minutes. Um, can I open it up for any questions from the audience? Any questions for the audience? Uh, there's one there. There's a question for Harry. Um, you run the Youth Advisory Group at DFM Project Search. Uh, would you be able to tell me a little bit about that and what have you gained from it? Okay, so the Youth Advisory Group at DFM Project Search, I believe it's very unique. Before I joined, I joined as the, as the Youth Advisor to help set up the Youth Advisory Group. And within our first year, we really see the need the need to educate young people and the need to listen, to close our youth advisors, just let us be part of the conversation. And that's what we are aiming to do, is to let them have the same opportunities and have them, they're amazing. They stand up and they'll tell us straight away if we've got something wrong or if something needs to change. They are really guiding us to make sure, not just our organisation, but the organisations we're working with, our partners are fully inclusive and fully fully inclusive and fully understands that diversity enriches an organisation and challenging the barriers that they face every single barriers that they face, barriers that disabled people face every single day, breaking down those barriers and looking for solutions to a positive outlook on life. So it's been an honour to work with such amazing young people. Thanks very much, Harry. And, and in fact, the Youth Advisory Group has been incredible because it's, um, it's really given me a chance to hear the, you know, the voice of the people going through our programs. And also, we're going to have uh, one of them on our board. Um, we've now got a th over 1,000 youngsters um, going through our programs. So we're going to also bolt on a, an alumni group as well. There's a question over. Question here. Yeah. Um, I've got a question for Dylan. Um, what reasonable adjustments did Enable make for your job um, to make it more accessible for you? Firstly, as you might have guessed, I have a, or maybe not, I have a learning disability and autism, which means that reasonable adjustments had to be made for me to start my job. The first one was that Enable gave me a practical interview rather than speaking through the skills that I had so that I could show off the skills rather than guide through by speech. Then what they did when I started was they gave these three options, which all of which were taken, which were firstly 
a two screen aesthetic, which most people with a learning disability or autism would possibly need to make their job more fruitful. Then the second one was a quiet space to have a lunch if it was required. And the final thing was they gave me the kind of the use of earphones to listen to music to keep my concentration up. But and the bonus to all those was they didn't come at much cost to the organisation at all. That's fantastic, Dylan. So, so under um, UK law, um, all these guys have the right to think of reasonable adjustments. So that means that if you employ them, they have the right to actually um, apply for through the D. Well, I speak for England, the DWP, um, for somebody to, you know, what adjustments does the employer need to make? to allow that individual to fulfill their job properly and reasonable adjustments. And um, I don't think it's well understood by a lot of employers, but it's out there. So um, instead of, you know, so we've all got, you know, impediments, you know, uh, we're, all, uh, we're all human beings at the end of the day, but we also have all got tremendous strengths. So I'd encourage you to look at employing um, young adults with learning disabilities, because once you train them up, they are absolutely sensational they'll they'll generally stay in the job longer they'll generally you know they won't gossip they'll be great culture carriers of the organizations they'll lift the organizations and ultimately there's a, there's a ton of studies on this they'll actually make your firms perform better but they might need little reasonable adjustments and and that's okay and it's part of changing the culture we heard that from the panelists earlier the Clifford Chance partner you know you might have to tweak your organizations a bit but that's part of um, just you know resetting to today's environment one more question, and I think we're done. Uh, hi. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, well, it's one for, for for all of you. If you had one thing that uh, we as employers could do to support you outside of reasonable adjustments, what would it be? Do you want, should we start, Charlie? One thing, or we'll start with Harry. Harry, what one thing could employers do to help support you or support people like you? So, support people like me outside of reasonable adjustments. Take a chance. Take a chance on sponsored internship, volunteer opportunities, and let the young people show you themselves, or go into a school and go and learn from young people, because what, you, what they can teach you to is far more than what I can put into one conversation or one quote today. Um, what I would recommend is don't look at the factors on the outside. Look at the factors on the inside. They count more than anything. I think give a big round of applause to my three panellists. Quiet, 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 quiet. Excellent. Thank you so much. Great to see you talking. And I, I incredible apologies to interrupt you all. Uh, it's fantastic that the, the discourse is happening, which is what these uh, sessions are all about. But within that, we want to have a bit of structure and we want to hear from our commissioners uh, on stage here who are, are going to give us the feedback from your uh, respective groups. I'm not going to do much more than uh, say hello to them, allow them to introduce themselves and their group uh, and what their group was talking about. Uh, so um, I don't know where to start really, I'll start here. If you can start and give us a, a, a sense of what your group was talking about and what, what, what was the kind of main learnings and findings from it, that'd be marvellous and introduce yourself of course. Good afternoon, everyone. Delighted to be here today. My name is Zara. I'm CEO of GapSquare. We develop software to help businesses look at pay gaps and understand how those pay gaps, understand how they can pay people fairly. Uh, inevitably, then, I had the session around the pay gap reporting and how, if I can get this right, uh, how pay gap reporting is a prerequisite for making measurable progress towards harnessing and nurturing diverse talent. It's been a, a really interesting conversation with a fascinating group of people where we spoke about data and the role of data in taking decisions around diversity and inclusion. And few key themes emerged. I'm going to try and be very succinct. One of the main things is that data is a key driver for change. We see data utilized everywhere. I've given an example in the session, and I keep on giving this example everywhere. Five years ago, the World Economic Forum was telling us we are 217 years away from achieving pay parity. At the same time, the World Economic Forum is telling us that by 2030, a lot of us will be in self-driving cars. NASA is telling us by 2030, we will be waving people off to Mars. 
And yet when we're there in our self-driving cars, waving those people off to Mars, we will still be 200 years away from achieving pay parity. So a lot of the key conversations that are happening now are around how do we harness that data that we have, access to data, access to tech, access to innovation, to empower businesses to create that pay fairness and make sure that we don't have a gap by 2030 when we're in self-driving cars waving people off to Mars. So we all aligned on the fact that data is a key driver for change. Um, as long as we think about the capacity of the organization to understand what to do with that data and actually do something meaningful with that data. Um, the fact that data is not a separate island, it does not sit separate in the organization. It actually is embedded across it and is a reflection of the business. There's also a culture piece that feeds into the data and self-reporting mechanisms and self-identification also need to be taken into account when we look at that data and try to make meaning of it. Use of different platforms to understand data. We've had someone in the group uh, talk about Be Applied, which is a platform that looks at recruiting by removing bias from the recruitment um, process. So kind of looking at the different innovative tools out there that bring data into play and allow organizations to do things differently. Because at the end of the day, one, one thing that came to my mind as we were having these conversations is we can't keep doing what we've always been doing and expect that all of a sudden we're going to have results. Something definitely needs to change. We, do, we need to start doing something dramatically different. One other key point that we've discussed around data is how it's used as an incentive versus as a uh, force for shaming organizations. So the, the culture around the gender pay gap reporting and how that is sometimes used as a disincentive for organizations to be transparent. How do we turn that around? How do we utilize that data despite the fact that there will be gaps to talk about? Some organizations in the financial sector, for instance, will be reporting really high gaps. How do we create a culture that incentivizes those organizations to be open and transparent about that data and therefore engage in a, in a conversation around creating change? There's all, the, the cultural piece came strongly into this, and, and I, uh, I'm going to wrap up our key points from the group here. The culture piece and the fact that actually behind every single data point, there's a human being. When we're talking about data and we're talking about diversity and inclusion and how we use that data to create change, there's a person behind every number, two people, three. They have aspirations, they have dreams, they have fears about how they're going to be perceived if they disclose certain information about themselves to the organization they work in. So a lot of complexities to unpick, but I think also a lot of opportunity and, and excitement overall within the group to look at data and understand how we can move forward and create change. Thank you so much. Um, so hi, I'm Paul Donovan. I'm the chief economist at UBS Global Wealth Management. Uh, and I was leading the group on why it pays to invest uh, in equity and inclusion. Uh, and uh, we had a very lively discussion. There were lots of points, more points than we could fit in. But uh, I think probably three key themes came out of the discussion. The first of these was around the importance of, of employees. So investing in order to get the right people in place. And that was a combination of things. It was firstly about uh, attracting employees into the organization. Um, so the whole recruitment thing, but particularly with the younger generation. Uh, there was then the element uh, of making sure that when you get employees in place, you are able to use them as effectively as possible. You're maximizing the skills that they bring uh, and why that's particularly important in all of this. And also there was, a, there was an interesting discussion about the role of employees in pushing organizations uh, to continue to invest in equity and inclusion, uh, because you, you need to keep and retain talent, um, and the employees themselves can, you know, via employee networks, effectively form internal lobbying groups in terms of pushing in this direction and feed back into encouraging additional investment. Uh, the second issue that came out of the uh, importance of investment, and it comes back to your point on data, I'm afraid, measurement uh, of output and this being so, so important in the whole process. Because if you don't measure the output of your employees in an entirely objective manner, then you may 
you know, end up like Jacob Rees-Mogg putting post-it notes on everyone's desk saying, why aren't you here? To which the response is, because I'm being more productive at home a long way away from you. Um, and that's something that we seem to, to need to get right. Certainly in my world of economics, this is woefully inadequate. We're just not measuring output and productivity in a more flexible working environment uh, at this stage. And we need to get this right in order to be able to understand uh, the benefits of equity and inclusion and then invest more in that. So invest in the data to make sure that we understand what we're doing correctly. And then the third concept was a, a discussion around um, ESG as a, a financial investment concept and the fact that the, the S, the social part of environmental, social and governments, has perhaps been uh, overshadowed by environment over the last few years. And I think that has absolutely been the case. But we're now starting to see perhaps a number of uh, investors, a number of firms asking companies about what is their diversity and inclusion policy. Um, you know, and if a, a, an all-white male, bald, middle-aged panel turns up to pitch for business, you're more likely to reject them out of hand because that doesn't demonstrate the sort of company that you want to do business with. <laughs> um, so perhaps the, the optimistic note uh, there is that there's a requirement to invest in uh, EDI because it's something which the company's investors are going to be increasingly be asking about as well as the employees. But we do need to get the measurement of all of this absolutely right. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. David? Um, my name's David Forbes-Nixon. I'm um, executive chair of uh, DFN Foundation and DFN Project Search. And... Um, my focus is really disability. I have three boys. My youngest boy is disabled. And uh, through his eyes, I've seen how poor the provision is both for education and employment for disabled people in the UK, um, taking those in turn. So education, um, we kept Charlie in mainstream school as long as we could. The gap got wider and wider. He got fed up. We looked at 20 special schools um, you know, close to where we lived. None of them were fit for purpose. Looked like prisons or hospitals. Um, very much holding pens where you drop your kid off, pick them up, extremely low expectations. So I ended up setting up a special school in Surrey. Um, I bought Conan Dahl's old house um, called Undershore in Hindhead. It's now a vibrant special school. My son went there for nine years. That's all very, very fine. But what I, what I realized was the bigger issue was when they leave school or college, only 5% of these youngsters aged at 25 are in full-time jobs, which is a complete shocker. If we call ourselves a civilised society, I think that's totally unacceptable, versus 80% of their peer group. Um, and there's some really interesting themes that came out of our discussion, um, which I think are relevant. One is um, we've got a very tight labour market, but there's 1.4 million unfilled vacancies. Maybe the lowest skilled jobs, but 1.4 million post-Brexit, post-COVID. I can tap into a million of um, young adults with learning disabilities and autism that can do a lot of those jobs if they have the right training program. And guess what? The numbers are a no-brainer for government. You know, if, if you're one of the 95% that's living off benefits for the rest of your life, if you don't have a job by 25, it's extremely unlikely you'll get a job if you're one of this cohort. The cost, the net present value of benefit payments is two to three million, not including mental health, family breakup, other, um, other bad issues that would come out, potentially come out of it. And it costs 20,000 to go through a program like ours. So it's a no-brainer from a government perspective. And actually, you know, touched on data and ESG, again, you know, I think really important points. You've got to measure. So there's a whole load of um, internship programs which supposedly are, are, are delivering positive destinations or volunteering or whatever it is. Um, I, we're very ruthless about, DFN Project Search is very ruthless about measuring outcomes. So I've hired somebody just on the data side, a, a Python program, and we look at, we dice and slice, you know, every which way you can imagine from gender, ethnicity, um, types of jobs, how long they've, they've been in their jobs, how much they're being paid, et cetera, et cetera. Really, really important stuff. Um, but uh, it has to be proper full-time paid jobs. And um, this talent pool is really interesting for businesses. So you've got um, a lot of the youngsters, the Gen Zs coming through, who are maybe less driven than we were by just making a, huge, you know, making a lot of money. 
but they really care about the types of organizations they're working in. They really care about the S part of ESG. They really care about what companies are doing in terms of giving back to communities. They care about the diversity of the actual workforce that they're working for. Um, and this is all about the culture. So I think it's, it's not a sort of nice to have, it's an absolute must have. We now have um, 1,000 youngsters going through our program every year. We're looking to triple that in the next three or four years. We've got funding. Um, I'm providing some funding. We've got funding from DfE. We've got funding from foundations. Um, we now need business to embrace this. Uh, you know, Goldman Sachs, um, uh, DPD, hospitals, um, universities. We've got a whole raft of host businesses. Um, I need you guys to come forward as host businesses and embrace it and work with me. The last thing I'd say is that um, it's very important to... Um, th these kids are really, really good. You know, if you hire them, they generally stay in their jobs three and a half times longer. They're great culture carriers. They don't gossip. They don't ask for a pay rise in sort of six months' time. They're on time. They take less days off sick. They are awesome lifting organisations, softening them, actually. But there's a lot of data to show that they actually improve profitability. Um, but we, uh, we need people to sort of come on this journey with us. And actually, we had, had three um, youngsters with learning disabilities on the panel today. And I have to say, they, they were my highlight because they were awesome. They took, one of them talked about his experience on our program. The other two took questions from the audience. And they were just very, very powerful. So um, these are good guys. Um, embrace them. And I think, you know, now is the time. You know, let's, don't hesitate. Just... Um, you know, very, very, very excited to work with any of you that are interested. Thank you very much, David. Uh, Steve. Cool. Um, well, I don't want to repeat all that's been said, but uh, and I'm sure that was powerful uh, on that panel. Uh, I wish I'd been in that room. Um, so my name's Steve Ingham. I'm the uh, CEO of Page Group, uh, a recruitment business, um, and uh, I've been there. 36 years and 17 years uh, as CEO, and we're a FTSE 200 company. Relatively small, 9,000 people, but uh, we highlighted the importance of diversity and inclusivity in our business and also in the businesses of our clients. Uh, we've hired into Page 3,500 people this year um, at huge cost. Uh, we've grown a lot, which I'm pleased to say we've had a record year, um, but also we've had to replace the attrition. Um, and we think we're aware of uh, why people left us, uh, and I think we've got a reasonable measure on it, but uh, I suspect all of you have got a reasonable measure, or you think you have, on why people left your businesses as well. Uh, of course, Paige often get the real reason, and I can tell you now the biggest single reason why people are leaving businesses is because of the culture. It's not because of the money, it's not because they didn't like their boss, I mean, may, that may have contributed, but, uh, you know, maybe multiple reasons, but it, the main one will always be culture. Uh, you know, it, the, the values, the purpose of the organization didn't match their purpose and values. Uh, and this often hinges around DNI. Um, at Page and many of our most productive clients, we believe that if you get as much as you can and nobody will ever perfect it, uh, if you are more diverse, if you are more inclusive, you'll be more productive. You'll also save yourself money. In terms of recruitment, I know, I'm glad to say, is an expensive process. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's best to be avoided, uh, if possible. Um, and I really believe the more inclusive you are, uh, the more productive you will be, for many of the reasons that have been highlighted here. Um, it's not going to be fixed overnight. We, we, did a, a, we, we have a presentation, there's a QR code in the room that we were doing our, our panel. Um, and it highlights all of the initiatives we've, we've taken over the last 12 years, and there are a lot. But bit by bit, things have improved to the record level of attrition, low attrition that we've got today. And that's certainly helping the fact that we're going to have a record profitable year this year. Um, it's a long journey, it's a hard one, but the rewards are remarkable. The questions, uh, are there good and bad companies out there in terms of clients and so on? Yes, there are, of course. I honestly believe if you put two companies in the same industry with similar products and so on side by side, the more inclusive one would win uh, and be more profitable and more successful. So, you know, it's something that business leaders need to get right. And then I think finally we talked around we need more role models. Uh, we need more authenticity uh, from leadership. Um, and the more we get of that, perhaps the more 
we will uh, end up focusing on it and make strides forward. Um, so that was largely the focus of our group without going on too long. Fantastic, Steve. Uh, well, thank you very much for concluding that. I, I, I did an interview with Steve about a year ago. Uh, if you want to know more about Steve's story as well, in the FT. Um, excellent. Well, that was fantastic. Lots there about the economic basis, the, the, the commercial reasons why people should all be thinking about this. This is not some sort of do-gooder thing. It's not woke. This is, this is pure commercial imperative and societal imperative as well, as we, we've been hearing. And the importance of data as well, incredibly, incredibly useful and incredibly clear there as well. So thank you so much to uh, the commissioners here. Thanks so much for taking part in those panels. Um, we're running slightly over time, so all I can say is that if, if we can come back for four o'clock now, that'd be marvelous for our last session before we break for drinks. So thank you so much. <laughs>